J'adore les femmes. Il n'y a rien que j'aime plus Et que les femmes. Énormément des hommes misogynes disent ça. Tu restes solide, j'ai besoin de toi, maman. Ça va aller, mon fils. Hello and welcome to your weekly film show here on Encore. As of July 21st, France requires health passes for adults to enter cinemas. That's proof you've been double vaccinated or that you've tested negative or that you were recently recovered from COVID-19. 12 to 17-year-olds must follow the same requirements starting August 30th. That's something cinema goers will have to think about on top of picking what to watch. And to help us with the latter, I'm joined on set by France 24's film critic Lisa Nesselson. Um, hi, Lisa. Your first pick this week is a documentary about uh, Helmut Newton that's out here in French cinemas. The German-born photographer took unmistakable portraits that graced fashion magazines and art galleries for decades. He died in 2004 at the age of 83. Tell us more. Well, Helmut Newton, The Bad and the Beautiful in English and L'Impertinent in French is a sweetly informative portrait of a bottomlessly creative image maker. He was accused of being a pervert and a voyeur, but the vividly fond memories of the women he photographed, interviewed here at length, make it clear that he was a considerate gentleman and a superb collaborator. His beloved wife, June, uh, a terrific photographer in her own right, under the uh, name Alice Springs, died just this past April at age 90. This is a really entertaining film. Now, he may uh, come across as a considerate gentleman, but for some people, he represented the male gaze, and there was some pushback for that. Yes, in fact, several French film critics told their publications they'd like to write a feature article on the film, only to have younger employees protest that Helmut Newton had no place in their pages because he objectified women. Well, just how off far off the mark this attitude is, is made extremely clear via the interviews with the strong, interesting women who worked with him and were delighted to do so. Here's a list. Charlotte Rampling, Grace Jones, Marianne Faithful, Hannah Shagula, Claudia Schiffer, Anna Wintour, Isabella Rossellini. These are not ladies you easily exploit or push her out. Rampling said what they achieved together, which was her very first nude shots as a, as a young woman, may have been the best photo shoot of her life. And she says it's great to be a provocateur. That's what the world needs. All right, well, uh, let's take a look at uh, Helmut Newton, The Bad and the Beautiful. You could look at any image and say that's a Helmut Newton photograph. The photos were frightening, but there was always a sense of humor. He said, I've always wanted to photograph a chicken wearing high heels. <sighs> Nothing was serious, everything understated. This man is incredible. He was a little bit pervert, but so am I, so it's okay. <laughs> He and I have something in common. We both started taking photographs uh, with a brownie box camera at the age of 12, but 36 years apart. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Helmut Newton twice. He was a sweetheart, playful, curious, lovely manners. His sense of visual humor was superb. He tricked Jean-Marie Le Pen into being photographed in a pose identical to a famous portrait of Adolf Hitler. If you weren't aware of the extra layer of meaning, well, it was still an excellent photograph. And he was born in 1920 and was a Jewish boy in Berlin surrounded by Nazi iconography. He developed a rigorous aesthetic sense and technical expertise as an apprentice to a leading female photographer who was exterminated in the war. All right, uh, next to a film that won the Ensemble Prize in the Uncertain Regard section at Cannes this year, uh, Good Mother, the story of a working class woman called uh, Nora living in the north of Marseille. And it's the actor's authenticity that impressed you the most, Lisa. Yes, Nora is played by non professional Halima Ben Hamed, who had never acted before and merely accompanied her daughter on an audition. She is radiantly stoic as the central character, Nora. She's diligently holding together several generations through just about endless work, both paid and unpaid. The narrative is a seemingly effortless example of all the intersectionality, diversity, and women in front of and behind the camera anyone could possibly clamor for. Actress turned director Hafsia Herzi, that was her dancing and dancing and dancing some more in The Secret of the Grain, shot on location in the low-income housing project directly across from the one in which she herself actually grew up. Uh, the faces and places feel authentic because, well, they are. Handwork, handheld camera work, and uh, the religions at uh, the religion. 
the region's extremely distinctive light help give the material what I think is lived-in authenticity. All right, France 24 uh, interviewed uh, Hertzi before the uh, Cannes Film Festival. Take a listen. I wanted to tell the story of a woman, well, two women from different generations, as it's true there are a few characters in the film, but the mother is a pillar of it all. I wanted to depict motherly love of this woman who is alone and who keeps going just for her children and will keep going until her last breath for her children. I also wanted to show these characters that you rarely see in film, and I wanted to film in these housing projects before they were eventually torn down. We learn gradually about the full extent of Nora's employment commitments and just how many people either live with her or depend upon her in a ratty housing project where the elevators never work. Uh, and Nora's smile is slightly wistful, but she lives by a personal code of kindness, bolstered by never-ending effort. Nora never complains. If urban isolation and loneliness are a reoccurring topic in films, well, Nora can be said to have almost too many human connections. She is dignity personified and when hit with unexpected expenses or another setback, she's pragmatic. But does endless sacrifice end up being the good mother of the title? Well, that's one to watch uh, there, Lisa. Now, to uh, the uh, 74th Cannes Fest Film Festival that attracted at least uh, 20,000 people despite the still active threat of COVID-19. What do you think the future of screens is, Lisa? Well, all I can say is people were incredibly happy, happy to applaud, uh, to have the communal experience of watching movies together mm. on huge screens in Cannes. Now, some pundits think streaming films at home or on portable devices will take the place of cinemas. And if that does come to pass, I'm confident that France will remain to brick and mortar theaters as Egypt is to pyramids. We'll always be there. That said, there are some nifty innovations in the world of screens that you definitely cannot recreate at home. Filmmaker Paul Schrader recently said uh, that these new screens may point to a possible future for seeing moving images in a communal way. I was incredibly impressed by the ideal gallery that opened to the public in late June at Clos Lucet, about a two-hour train trip from Paris. Clos Lucet is the beautifully preserved estate where Leonardo da Vinci lived and worked the last three years of his life, employing a battery of finely tuned projectors. I really don't know how they do this. The Ideal Gallery provides the immersive sensation of examining 17 of Leonardo's most famous paintings, which have never all been shown together for real. You'd have to go to the Vatican, the Hermitage, the, the Louvre, uh, and many other, the, uh, many other uh, museums to see them. The technique compares details such as how he painted hands or faces from canvas to canvas, and is projected seamlessly on the walls of a reverent chapel-like space. I was incredibly moved by the way the technology amplifies the artistry. Also uh, under the heading of new screens, Mania City is the name of a French app that lets you uh, dig deeper into the history of your surroundings. How does that work? Well, uh, everybody should go to the top of the Eiffel Tower at least once in their life to see Paris from on high. But obviously, if you look out over Paris from the Eiffel Tower, uh, then the tower won't be part of what you see. For that, I suggest the observation deck of the 56-story high Tour Montparnasse, which reopened to visitors in June. They say they welcome one million tourists each year. Year. The view itself, of course, is terrific, but the augmented reality app, Magnicity, available free of charge for iOS and Android, lets you point your device at monuments on the horizon and then receive an overlay of historic photos, text, even short videos. You can learn about the French capital when it was Lutece or painlessly bone up on historical tidbits created with input from specialists. Magnicity designers are adapting this technology for other tall buildings, including what Chicagoans like me call the Hancock Building. All right, and you're wrapping up with uh, another French innovation that's becoming quite popular abroad. 
That is the multi-camera magic delighting visitors to the Atelier des Lumières in the 11th arrondissement of Paris. Talk about an immersive experience. A revamped industrial space has been outfitted with perfectly calibrated space-age slide projectors that let you plunge into or feel enveloped by gorgeous enlargements, and I mean enlargements of great art. The Van Gogh show that originated here is on tour and currently attracting crowds in Chicago. Salvador Dali, I think, would have loved this technology because his artistry can definitely stand up to the way larger-than-life treatment. And Gustav Klempt's uh, work also looks great via these unconventional screens. Okay, we'll uh, leave you with a glimpse of the Dali exhibit at the Atelier de Lumière in just a sec. Lisa, thank you for your wrapper films to watch and your analysis of screens old and new. Thank you for watching. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, uh, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.